Good morning and welcome to the Center for Automotive Research's Industry X webinar series. Today is on technology. This is a part of the continuing project and webinar series here at the Center for Automotive Research. My name is Brett Smith. I'm Director of Technology at the Center for Automotive Research and host for this series. We have two speakers today who we'll get to in a moment. Uh, first, Dr. Florian Bauman, who is CTO Unstructured Data from Dell Technologies. And the other is Tom Mott, North American Industry Manager, Auto, Tire, and Aerospace from Rockwell Automotive. Um, and with that, I will, I will step into a few opening comments and we'll have each of our two speakers, uh, Dr. Bauman and, and Tom, Mott speak, and then we'll do a round table. There'll be a round table, a question and answer period. Um, you'll be able to submit questions um, and we will go through those uh, over the process. Um, so let's go. I wanted to start um, maybe in a, a direction that probably you didn't think I'd start in, um, but I'll argue that the digitalization of manufacturing started in Traverse City, Michigan about 65 years ago. A guy by the name of John Parsons, who actually was a family friend, a good friend of my father's way back then, um, started to put numerical control and computer numerical control together. And, and what began the process of taking the, the non-computer in manufacturing into this space of computers and manufacturing. I remember my father back in the 70s telling me what, what John Parsons had done was earth shattering and, and good at changing the world and it was phenomenally important for machine tools. And I remember being in Traverse City and thinking, great, Dad, I just want to go to the beach. Let me go to the beach. Uh, 50 years later, um, I'm reminded of, of how this started. So it's a, if you go back in time, there, there's a long string um, between this and uh, computer controlled machines and, and where we are now. But where we are now is a really fascinating, fun time. Um, and as part of that, the Center for Automotive Research has been doing a project and we'll get to in a moment. Um, and on that project, we've come up with these webinars as part of that. Today, we want to talk about technology. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about people um, in Industry X, Industry 4.0. Um, today, it's technology. And as I said, we have Dr. Florian Bauman, who is the um, Unstructured CTO of Dell Technologies Unstructured Data Solutions, and Dr. Um, and Tom Mott, North American Industry Manager for Auto, Tire, and Aerospace Rockwell Automation. These two, I think, are a great kick it, it lead up to what we're trying to talk about with data and, and technology. As we've looked at Industry X over the last several year or so on this, on this project, um, we understand more and more every day that manufacturing, industry 4.0, the, the part that deals with industry and manufacturing is just one small portion of that. Both of our speakers today are very comfortable, very knowledgeable world leaders in understanding that manufacturing portion of it. But equally important to this discussion is both Florian and Tom understand it's not just the technology on the plant floor. It's just not the putting new shiny objects into a plant. It's about the process and the flow of data and understanding what that data means and what it can do and, and where it can go. As we've looked at Industry X for this project, um, we've looked at four real building blocks, technology, strategy, process, and people. And last, uh, during the last webinar, I, I suggested that I put people in the middle for a reason um, of, the, of this triangle. It really is fundamental to everything. But as you look at the technology, it is also a key part of this. It's part, without the technology, we can't do any of this. But that technology becomes just an enabler. Um, I've mentioned this project, oh, last webinar a couple times today. We have been very fortunate at the Center for Automotive Research to have brought together a group of companies, and we call this the, uh, the Industry X ecosystem. And as you walk through that group of companies, Intel, Dell, Cloudera, Rockwell, PTC, Accenture, and Microsoft Azure, you see a really broad reach of what 
this industry is about, what this industry X presents. Um, they are both companies that have been traditional automotive companies and maybe companies that aren't so traditional automotive. But together, they, they, they present this broad range of what Industry X is doing. Uh, the industry, Car Industry X project has had multiple input, inputs. And, and over the last six, seven months, we've been doing long form interviews with automotive suppliers and manufacturers. We've had a brief technology survey and we've done industry roundtables. And, and this project, again, reminds me of, of what a joy it is to work at CAR and what an honor it is. We have had great access to industry folks um, from the supply side, the manufacturing side. And as we've gone through this project, we continue to see the companies um, open their arms and engage with us. But we also see them, I think, really struggling with industry X and industry 4.0 as, as the next steps. Um, during the round table, we asked, what excites you about industry X? And this was a group of, of funders of industry, uh, suppliers, manufacturers, and other stakeholders. And um, really what came to the forefront during those discussions, during those interactions, was this tension of the transformation. There were other things, improvement and, and efficiency and new solutions and data and those types of things. But more and more as we did this word mapping, um, we saw this idea of transformation. This really does present a transformation for this industry. We also asked them, what about Industry X keeps you up at night? And this was a little more interesting in that it was a really group diverse set of answers. There wasn't one thing. We noticed with um, what excites you, it was really came back to this transformation, this ability to change a 120 year old industry. With what keeps you up, all of these things popped up, but they popped up just as ones and twos and threes amongst the people. And there was no real consensus about what tended to keep them awake at night. Everything keeps them awake at night, or maybe differently, something keeps each person in individually. I spoke of the interviews we have done with 20 companies, uh, suppliers, manufacturers, um, talked of technology in, in those interviews and, and the report will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, but as part of that, um, Industry X provides opportunity for use innovative new technologies and, and new ways of putting um, new technology into the manufacturing. Um, but it isn't necessarily chasing the shiny object anymore. The companies, I think, have started to realize that technology is absolutely important. But there has to be a real return on investment to it. Um, and, and some of that return on investment was data. They would all, everyone we've talked to on this project has said, we believe data is becoming as important, as valuable as the product. That was really interesting though, and, and I think we have two, two, two gentlemen here today, um, Florian and Tom, that can talk about that data. But it was interesting as we went through this process, these interviews, these discussions, these long form sit down and talks, where the people that said, we know the data is important, also said, we don't necessarily know what to do with that data yet. We have so much of it, and there's so many things we can do, we're not sure what's, what's really happening with it. Um, and they also said, you know, if data's in the driver's seat, artificial intelligence is the co-pilot. Every interview included a discussion about AI, uh, the range of capabilities, strategies, and understanding of those people regarding AI was staggering. Most admitted they didn't really understand it, but they knew it was important, or they understood part of it, but they didn't understand the whole aspect. And this, I think, another ask, another opportunity to talk about this today is um, what does data and then the AI connection to it mean for this industry and how are companies responding to it? We've looked at technology adoption trends, and these are just based off of this small sample size based off of our interviewees. Uh, but you can see they've already pretty much uh, remote performance monitoring, data lakes, edge computing, and things that they're doing um, for the most part. As you get down to machine learning, starting to implement that as, as, as a group amongst them, 
digital twins, something that they're looking at, um, starting to look at more and more. And then 5G network, uh, is, uh, the discussion inevitably had to come back to, is your facility 5G capable? And, and not yet, um, not even soon for some, but um, interesting kind of technology steps and data there. I talked about this project and, and these three functions. But what I left out, I think, was what we as researchers found maybe most intriguing as we went along was the ecosystem that was involved in this project for us, um, and two of them today. Part of this project was not only to talk to the car companies, but also spend time with the, with the experts, with the industry technology um, specific experts. And as, as Kari did the interviews, the long form interviews, the round tables, the technology briefings, uh, so, surveys, we also had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with the technology companies. And it was really important in this project, and I think it was important for the technology companies and important for, for the suppliers and vehicle manufacturers in this process, because it, it shows this complex world that we're stepping into. Part of what we wanted to bring from that group of companies, this group of, of companies, was those that knowledge that, that we as researchers had access to over the last eight months. And as I said, we'd, we'd go to the car companies, we'd go to suppliers, we'd go back and talk about issues with the with the um, the funders, with the tech companies. We'd go back to the car companies and back and forth. And as we did that, as researchers, we thought this is really good discussion. We think it's worth bringing some of this to the to the web. To the um, to the um, survey to the car associates and car, car stakeholders. So two or three weeks ago, we had the uh, industry X people um, with Sue Helper and Liz Reynolds from MIT, who are also involved in this project, and Dr. Irene Petrick from Intel. Um, that is actually available at, at the car website. Um, today we have again Florian and Tom talking technology. Next week, Michael Gurr and Brian Irwin and I will get together and talk about strategy and, and some of the things we learned on the bigger picture of implementation. <clears throat> so we hope you'll um, check out all three of those. We appreciate you joining us today. With that, as I lose my voice again, um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Florian, and Florian will speak, and then Tom, immediately after that, we'll, we'll have you go, and we'll come back for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brett. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. And can you see my screen? Yes. Um, part of it. Yes. I guess now you can see everything. Yeah. Brett, thank you very much for, for this great introduction. Um, I, am, I fully agree with a lot of statements that you've um, that you told us, especially that um, you would need mm -hmm. to define a return of investment before focusing on, on any new products. And today I'm, I'm speaking about um, the in industry X. I'm, I'm trying to focus on technology and how, how this industry is trying to transform itself. My name is Florian and I'm working as a CTO focused on automotive and AI at mm -hmm. Dell Technologies. And I'm based in Germany at the beautiful Lake of Constance in, in south of Germany. So thank you very much, Brad. And let me start. So what, what's Dell doing in the automotive industry? We are pretty active um, in the automotive industry around a lot of topics such as smart factories, predictive maintenance, the development of self-driving cars and ADAS functionalities. And ADAS, ADAS functionality stands for Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. And it is, for example, a traffic sign recognition or an autonomous emergency braking system. So we are pretty active in that industry with around about 40 automotive customers only focused on AD, ADAS. AD stands for autonomous driving. We have a lot of storage deployed um, that is used by, by our automotive companies. And we have a global team of industry experts to support our, our customers in, in succeeding in, in, in a variety of different use cases. I'm working as a subject matter expert. So I'm supporting our customers around designing um, artificial intelligence processing pipelines, for example. <clears throat> and Dell is a, a hardware company, in fact, the biggest 
IT infrastructure provider of the world. And our goal is to offer technology. So network, storage, compute, data management systems, microservice architectures to enable our customers to create end-to-end -end predictive maintenance um, solutions or end-to-end -end AD ADAS functionalities. And what we see on the market is a huge transformation. So um, until today, the traditional profit pool from, from an OEM such as Volkswagen, BMW, Daimler and so forth. Below you will see some, some examples and that consists of 99% of new car sales and classic parts and components. And only 1% out of this profit pool is generated by emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence enabled um, functionalities or electric and AD ADAS components or the electrification and also the data and connectivity use cases are only very small. And what we see on the market is a shift between profit pools from traditional profit, profit pools to emerging profit pools such as ICVs, intelligent connected vehicles, um, connected smart factories or AD ADAS functionalities, for example, the development of self-driving cars. In a couple of years, you will be able to purchase your seat heater for, for example, $1.99 from your vehicle. So if you, are, if you are cold and on your way into a skiing holiday, um, you could purchase your seat heater for $1.99, similar as you would have if you could buy this um, functionality out of um, the app store from your mobile phone. Another example is let's assume you have a long drive from Munich to Berlin and you are very tired, you could purchase your self-driving car functionality on demand for $19.99. So the profit pools will shift from traditional profit pools to emerging profit pools and also the, the ecosystem of partners will um, will blow up extensively because a lot of technology companies are trying to, to enter into this market. So Apple, Lyft, Uber, Waymo, um, AWS. So this ecosystem is, is um, increasing and we, we are seeing a lot of additional players. And it is also important to, to focus on, on um, new models to create and to monetize data. So um, very important as of today, we have the operating model of the vehicle as a product. And um, key investment areas in that area are for example, service platforms and electrification or level two of autonomous driving. Level two of autonomous driving is for example, a lane change assistant or an um, autonomous emergency braking system. And until 2030, we will see a fully digital ecosystem of many different players, such as um, electric vehicles, um, mobility as a service providers. Um, and you will also be able to purchase your um, functionalities that you want to have on demand from your vehicle, similar as you, you are using your mobile phone today. So the operating model will be a fully integrated ecosystem. But um, the way is, uh, we have a long way before we will achieve this fully integrated um, ecosystem because some milestones are the vehicle as a service and also mobility as a service, Uber and Lyft as an example. This is what we see on the market. And to focus a bit on key technology trends in the automotive industry, I, was, I, I will talk about, from my perspective, five trends. These trends are also describing the so-called industry X. So the first trend is definitely connected vehicles. So how to connect vehicles to almost everything, how to connect vehicles to the infrastructure to your own infra infrastructure, for example, to your own private cloud and also to the public cloud and how to connect vehicles to each other, to enable vehicles to talk to each other, 
if there's an accident coming up or a huge traffic jam, for example. And also very important in the area of connected vehicles is a functionality to connect them to the, the infrastructure of the smart city. In a couple of years, we will have dedicated road lane markings for self-driving cars, and we will have sensors in a traffic sign, and we will have sensors in a traffic light or even a small um, compute server located in the traffic light to um, connect with the vehicle, to enable the vehicle to look um, into, uh, into an area that, that's not visible to the vehicle. The second trend is definitely autonomous driving and self-driving cars. So in a couple of years, we will see self-driving cars on the field. But my, my personal opinion is that we will need 10 years to have self-driving cars operating everywhere. So the first phase could be, for example, that we will have an autonomous valet parking service. So you will drop your car on a, on a small box and your car will park autonomously in the parking garage. This will the first phase. The second phase could be that we will have dedicated roads only for self-driving cars. For example, a dedicated road between Munich and Berlin to enable self-driving cars to operate between these cities autonomously. Another example is the highway between Las Vegas and San Francisco. I guess this is a perfect highway to enable vehicles to operate autonomously. Then also very important in the Industry X area is um, compute and storage on, on the far edge. So compute and storage in the vehicle. A vehicle will be a data center on, on, on the road. And also compute and storage on the edge, for example, in non-data center environments. So smart factories will invest a lot of money in, um, in new infrastructures to fully um, automate um, the um, production process or to automate a logistic center, for example, to, help, to have self-driving robots operating in, in huge lo logistic centers. The, the fourth trend is around monetization. Um, and um, you've talked about this in your introduction, that we have to find um, an, an compelling ROI and compelling return of investment. And we have to also find new business models to monetize data because data is the most important asset that we have. And the last trend is focused on smart factories and it deals pretty much with how to move data from the far edge to the edge to core and to cloud. And this is also very important. And let me quickly introduce you into the typical automotive development process as we have it today at our um, big automotive customers, companies in general. So this chart is divided into four building blocks, boxes. It is tailored to the development of self-driving cars, but on the left side, you could have almost everything. It could be a traffic light, it could be a traffic sign, it could be a smart factory, it could be um, an automatic logistic center. The process is the same because in the first building block, you have to collect your data. And in the first building block, you have to also focus on connectivity um, challenges. So how to connect this vehicle or this smart factory through a, a real-time streaming platform with three infrastructure. The third building block is focused on the so-called edge. So this is an edge data center. This could be located in, in a smart factory or um, in, in a logistic center, for example. And in this smart edge, typically you have more compute power because normally you don't have so much compute and storage in the vehicle, but on the edge you have more compute and storage. So for example, one or two petabytes of data and data gets offloaded from the vehicle or the um, far edge into the satellite to already pre-process the data. So for example, to already identify um, um, valuable scenarios or to already identify relevant data that you want to use to create your new artificial intelligence or machine learning process. 
So companies are focused on cleaning data, preparing data and compressing data. Especially important in Corona times to save costs. So compress data to save storage costs, for example. Then we, we do also see that the centralized data lake, the third building block, is connected over the air with the, the far edge, in this case vehicles on the field, and also connected with um, the, the smart factory or the logistics center in order to move over data over the air and also in order to allow the algorithm to push out updates, for example, to improve the algorithm's accuracy back into the edge to improve the whole process. So typically in this huge centralized data lake, you will have a lot of compute, a lot of storage, and you are focused on large scale AI algorithm training and reprocessing of these algorithms. And the last building blocks, box is represented by the so-called data management system, the most important tool for our um, customers and developers in order to locate files, because this process is typically located everywhere in the world. So let's assume you have your centralized data lake in Germany, but you have um, attached satellites and production areas located in France, in Italy, in Spain, in Switzerland, mm -hmm in Sweden, everywhere in the world. And this data management system allows developers to orchestrate compute jobs and also to move data from one country into another country to train your global machine learning algorithm, for example. So as mentioned earlier, Dell is a hardware provider. So our goal is to provide the underlying um, infrastructure to enable our customers to develop processes like this. And we are offering a lot of solutions around compute, storage, streaming data platforms, microservice architecture, architectures, everything that you need to implement this service. And I'm coming to the end and I just want to remind you and um, please submit your questions into the chat. We are happy to answer them during the last um, 15 minutes and I'm handing back to Brad in order to kick off the next session. I guess Thomas will speak very soon. Thank you very much. Florian, thank you so much. And, and uh, we may have had some trouble with your advancing of your slides, but those will be available after the presentation, correct? So don't worry about it. We, we, we'll, we'll take care of it. But um, Okay, so have you seen any slides or no slides? Yeah, we can see the first slide and we weren't sure if you were advancing them or not. Ah, no, I was advancing them, but okay. It was not capturing in the in the transition. I'm, I don't oh, understand okay. why. I, I just didn't know. I'm sorry. Um, so our next speaker is is, is Tom Ma. And, and Tom, I think um, Lauren yep. described the idea of capturing, um, compare cleaning, and I'm sorry, capturing, compressing, and comparing data. You folks are in the business of capturing data, and and I think it's a good point to start with you and, and move forward. And I will be a little more proactive if your, your slides are not moving. We'll let you know. Uh, sure, sure. So I'm assuming you can see the first one, correct? You can see the first one. Okay, great. Yeah, so and you're exactly right. So I, more than let's call it the business of capturing data, we're really in the business of helping companies become more productive. And I'll, and I'll get into that a little bit, Brett. Uh, but I, I certainly, you know, want to thank Carr for inviting me to to have uh, to be a panelist with this discussion in the audience, and uh, to talk uh, about what Rockwell is doing. So when I started taking a look at um, uh, preparing for the discussion, you know, the first thing that came to mind was harnessing data, and, and harnessing in the context of of you know we've had data for a number of years, decades, for certain. But what's really accelerating now um, in terms of uh, what Rockwell is doing and, and a lot of our customers is the um, uh, really contextualizing the data and, and then using it um, in a much more real-time basis. Uh, oh. Okay. It's not so did, did the slide advance? Yes, but it's not showing fully. 
it's not showing fully. We're doing um, about the portion of the bottom cut off. Okay. I, well, I, I, so, uh, okay. Just go ahead and keep moving, Tom. We'll yeah, 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 sure. Not, not, not a problem. I'll, I'll do that. Thanks. The, um, uh, if you were to just click on slide number two on your slide sort of to the left, that might help. Yeah. No, that's as good as we can get. That's great. Super. That, that's better there. Oh, okay. So I'll keep it in this mode. That's fine. Um, so, so yeah, as I mentioned, Brett, I'm um, sorry for the technical glitch there, but, but really, you know, what Rockwell is doing now, and, and we've been making a number of investments over the course of uh, the last several years, it's really kind of connecting, um, you know, let's call it people with technology. And, and really our, our goal is to make, you know, to help customers uh, make intelligent decisions, become more connected and more productive. And, and this, in my opinion, fits very well into the scope of, of what the, the research and the paper is, is, you know, discovering also, is that it's really kind of this thing where we're tying processes, people, technology, and strategy. And, and, and I think everyone would agree that these things are very intertwined and, and all play an important role in the su overall success of the organization. Um, so with that said, you know, it's really uh, at, at this point kind of the, um, the overall potential, right? So what does digital transformation mean? Why uh, would, would companies specifically in manufacturing be interested in, in, in investing in digital transformation, et cetera? And, and there's a lot of uh, benefits that, that emerge very quickly. You know, so uh, if we talk very quickly around um, unplanned downtime, you know, improve quality, uh, let's call it reduced costs and maintenance, et cetera. So a lot of these use cases based on companies that are, have already started their digital transformation journey um, are starting to emerge. They're starting to, to share that with other uh, with companies, et cetera. And, and this kind of fits back into um, a little bit of, of, of what you're mentioning in your opening slides around this, you know, the part data continuum, right? So obviously, as we move from design to manufacturing, um, it, you know, historically that that was kind of a, a handoff location. Now what we're seeing with digital thread and a number of other things, that this is really a seamless transition uh, between the, um, uh, let's call it the design world and the manufacturing world. Um, so when we take a look at digital thread, and I think you you termed it as our data continuum, digital thread is what we use. Uh, we, we frequently hear this within the industry as well, but, but I think we're saying the same thing, Brett, it is that really what we're trying to do is you know collaborate uh, in real time across the value chain which would be, you know, to Florian's point, potentially even post-production and, and the use cases in the field. You know, uh, for instance, if it's mobility as a service or if it's vehicle as a service, all of these potentially could require data coming back to the manufacturing uh, locations and smart factories and, and help them understand the use of the product once it leaves and then rolls right back into the next design iteration. Um, so as we as we take a look at, you know, what the, the core components are of the vehicle, whether they be electrified vehicles, hybrid vehicles, hydrogen vehicles, all of these might be, you know, emerging and likely will be emerging over the next 15 to, to, to 20 years for sure. It, it is in terms of let's call it substantial volumes within the production environment uh, or the global production environment. The, um, so, so what I did mention though too is that, um, you know, getting back to the uh, original uh, concept of the paper between, you know, people, process, et cetera, what we're finding is, is that there, there is, uh, you know, a rapidly changing workforce. Uh, you know, we're, we're starting to see, and, and, you know, I think uh, one of your first lines on Parsons there in, in the, uh, let's call it the traditional numerical control and, and tying motors of computers, 
right? There's a whole generation that came through that phase of manufacturing. And, you know, they're going through a big uh, retirement uh, phase now. There's a lot of uh, uh, new entrants in terms of the workforce coming into the industry. And they have a very different skill set, you know. So they grew up in the computer age. Uh, they grew up potentially in a complete, let's call it mobile, real-time phase and things like this. So now what we're seeing is companies need, you know, manufacturing companies, that is, really need to adapt in terms of you know their legacy workforce versus is what's coming in as new talent, and and Rockwell's here to help that process with them. And and then on top of that, you know the processes themselves are becoming much more complex. So uh, so one. When one did to take a look at, this is kind of an overview around, let's call it uh, the connected machine, the connected plant, the smart factory. There, there's a, a number of things that feed into this. So up in the, the upper left corner, you see digital twin. So digital twin is really, you know, let's call it the computer representation of the equipment in terms that you can uh, uh, simulate, validate, uh, the process prior to building the machine. Um, and, and there's a number of things that go into, um, let's call it the, the smart or intelligent factory today. Whereas typically you would see some sort of IoT backplane. Um, and, and with that, it, it's really the IoT platform is the thing that gives, um, let's call it access to the data in a, in a very uh, seamless, um, and straightforward sense to those specific users, right? So for instance, a machine operator might have a very different looking screen or platform that can interact with the machine versus a plant manager or, or a regional vice president of operations that is interested in overall. Um, besides that, uh, Rockwell is uh, really expanding a, a lot of our, our work towards smart objects and smart objects are essentially uh, tags within the machine that now that we're pre, let's call it uh, configuring and extending those uh, data points that were already there under, uh, under the context of easier to capture. So for instance, um, you, maybe you had a pressure or a temperature tied to the process the smart object uh, perspective, really what it does is it gives you an extension beyond that in terms of how to collect the data, how to contextualize the data within the process. And, and really, you know, this approach in, in, in the lower right-hand corner, what you're seeing is that the uh, reduced effort in terms of contextualizing um, the process is tremendous around 70%, right? So for instance, uh, you might have a process before where you would, uh, you know, have a data scientist looking afterwards, um, you know, how the process ran, what uh, parameters to adjust. Now we're doing that in, in real time. So uh, this journey is what we call the connected enterprise within Rockwell. So, um, and, and what you're seeing here is that uh, the, the two hard hats, um, and it's important to say, um, that Rockwell has a long history of partnering. And, and really what this symbolizes is our partnership with PTC. So uh, PTC's logo is green and, and Rockwell's is, is red. And bringing these two organizations together, in our opinion, is, is a huge part of our success and our ability to serve the industry, right? So uh, Rockwell has a number of other partnerships as well. And uh, we feel that going to the market with partnerships uh, to make sure that we have the, uh, the right portfolio for customers is, is really the way to uh, not only help them with their productivity needs and their, uh, their workforce uh, transition needs, but also uh, core architecture and uh, digital transformation. And I'll pass it over back to you, Brett. Paul, thank you very much. And Florian, if you want to join us back, 
um, both of you. Thank you so much. Presentation spot on with, with what, what we've been working on over the last several months. Um, Tom, I want to go to you for a moment. This is questions and answers. Um, Sarah is sending me questions from the audience as we speak, so I'll kind of keep glancing over here. But you, you mentioned I, IT and OT kind of merging and not merging, but, but interacting more often. Um, during one of our roundtables, one of the uh, vehicle manufacturers, I believe, said, you know, I expect our OT people to have grease under their fingernails nowadays. I expect to see them on the plant floor to be working, to be in there understanding the processes. How has that transition gone for the OT-IT relationship as, as you've seen it? Yeah, I would say over the last probably at least two years, it's really starting to accelerate where we're starting to see companies um, have dedicated what they would call manufacturing IT resources uh, and uh, organizationally getting back to the kind of the, the people lag of, of this whole uh, process we've been working over the, the past several months is, is that it, it's an organizational structure decision, at least in my opinion, that really is starting to accelerate adoption and uh, progress in the field of that sharing technology. So for instance, um, you know, Rockwell as a, like part of our core uh, mm -hmm. architecture is our uh, control logics platform, but mm -hmm. it's ethernet capable. It's, um, you know, you could, it, programming it in, uh, in, in different sorts of uh, structures and things like this. And, and we're seeing that, that, that merge between the IT and, and OT is really becoming the new expectation of the, the leadership within our customer base. And then Florian, I want to go back. Um, you use an example. It is really interesting from our point as researchers to watch the companies, to talk to the companies, both the tech companies and the manufacturing companies. And this pathway, this, this trying to find the value of data, of digitalization. I want to talk a couple of things down that path. And Tom, you can help out here. Um, first though, I want to go back to your, I think you used the heated seats example. Heated system, yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind of cold in Michigan, although it's been a very, very mild winter fall. On the way into the office today, um, I turned on my heated seats. It was free. Why do I need yeah. a subscription? So let's assume, um, I guess, uh, before purchasing this vehicle, you paid maybe $500 for this uh, option. Mm -hmm. And let's assume that um, there's, there's a driver that doesn't really want to purchase a seat heater for $500 because he only need it, needs it for maybe two or three times per year. Mm -hmm. And then he can simply purchase it as a service yeah. um, for $1.99. It's somehow the shift between CAPEX and OPEX that we also see um, in, in, in that area. And it, it's also reflected by um, you don't purchase a movie anymore um, you will have a subscription at Netflix mm -hmm. or um, you're using Spotify or Apple Music instead of buying MP3s. Yes. And, and this is, from my perspective, exactly what we will see in, in the vehicle area also. Um, so you can buy everything on demand. Those are really, really fascinating examples. And it, I think it does show this, how this thought process is changing. And yet... yeah. Often working with a high work without a net in a lot of ways on this. Um, exactly. What other areas, on the, when you talk to the automotive industry, the manufacturing folks, both you Tom, and Tom, um, what are the areas you hear them talk about getting some real return quickly on data? On things that they're either implementing or saving in warranty costs or finding, what are some examples? Can you give your thoughts on, on this process of We've got this data, and Tom and, and, and Florian, you get so much data. We've got this data, we've done something with it, and we've made a return on investment. It was interesting as we talked to companies, they said, you know, we're finding those. Do you guys have some examples of, of things that were ROIs positive? So for, 
Um, Thomas, would you like to take this question or should I talk a bit about this? Yeah, why don't you start and then I'll follow up. Okay, so for, from my perspective, it's very important to define this ROI before you are starting to implement or to develop your pro product. This is most important. And if I'm talking to companies, very often they this part is missing. So they, they don't really think about an, an return of investment. But um, from my perspective, as mentioned earlier, it's crucial. And um, how to monetize this data? This is a, a very good question. And it strongly depends on on the use case. Um, let me think a bit about some of them. So let me give you one example. Um, mm -hmm. There's a company that has, let's assume it's a supermarket. And this supermarket, I don't know, a big one out of Germany, maybe Edeka or Rewe, a big supermarket chain has hundreds of vehicles on the street. And these vehicles and trucks are, are everywhere. They are driving thousands of kilometers per day. So how to monetize data? Um, they could use, for example, some, some sensors attached to the vehicle, like cameras, ra radar, LiDAR, they will have a GPS, for example, to send over some telemetry information. So they could monetize the data by trying to sell this data to automotive OEMs in order to already estimate a traffic jam, for example, or mm -hmm. already starting to estimate um, different weather conditions or an icy road. And this is a perfect example for a non-automotive company that, that has a lot of trucks on the field in order to monetize their existing um, processes on the field and to monetize data and also to find new revenue streams. And this is this is just one example. Um, I guess there are there are hundreds of, of more. Mm -hmm. so those those examples I think are interesting. Thanks for that one, Tom. How about you? Yeah, and I think in the manufacturing space, some of the the very quick ROIs tend to be you know traceability related. So, for instance, uh, many of our tier tier customers they have traceability uh, demands or requests from their customer base. Um, and as you know, uh, Dr. Bauman said, you know, the more we go to like call it the sensor enabled uh, existence, right? Whether that be vehicles connecting with stop signs or traffic lights, et cetera, the robustness and in, in the longevity of the sensors is going to be critical, right? So, you know, what happens with the failure modes? You know, what's the FEMA look like in terms of a traffic jam if, if the sensors aren't working, things like that. And, you know, I, I think they'll mature over uh, the next 10 to 15 years. And I, I agree with Florian on that space. But manufacturing, certainly, um, the use cases tend to be uh, operator specific or operator enabled, you know, where you see very quick ROI. Uh, also, in terms of uh, traceability and uh, let's call it customer uh, requests or demands, too. Um, and, and, and maybe just one more point, if I can, you know, getting back to the subscription, uh, you know, comment, uh, you know, companies in Wall Street, at least in, in the U.S., I mean, so certainly having a revenue stream outside of traditional is, is very in vogue right now. So uh, I think a lot of companies are looking to how to monetize, uh, let's call it non-traditional streams. And, and I like the example of the heated seat, right? Because, uh, you know, I look at my vehicle, um, it's, you know, it's a small crossover utility vehicle, right? Uh, like midsize. And, and the first thing they do, we're already doing this in infotainment. You know, they give you this, you know, two, three month subscription to OnStar for free. And then, you know, maybe you like it as part of your tran transition, or you know, and then you start paying the subscription. Maybe we could do the same thing for the skiers and the Alps, right? As you know, you give them a couple of tries for free in the uh, the heated seat, and then next thing you know, they, they yeah. want to pay the subscription. <laughs> you know, so it's like you know, pulling the little hook in there, right, Florian? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you can you can you could do so much cool stuff. You could introduce flat rates, a flat rate seat heater system. You could create bundles. The heated yeah. front window together with a heated uh, seat heating system, um, the traffic sign functionality on demand, the self-driving car functionality on demand, um, yeah. so much cool stuff. You know, yeah. you know, for, for, and I, I'm, I'm, 
you may have helped me flip on this. I'm not a believer in paying for my heated seat by the by the use, probably <laughs> because I use it a whole lot. But <laughs> when you start, <laughs> you have to pay a lot of money. Yes, and that when you start to talk about people's willingness for Netflix or for for iTunes or for the other things, when you start that that, that monthly subscription, um, it's you know it's it's certainly in the wheelhouse now. It's it's something. It's not something that's that's outside the wheelhouse. Although I still want it hidden in my MSRP, I think, um, for, for my next car. Maybe not the one after that. Um, I want to talk a bigger picture here. You know, we've got about uh, five or six, seven minutes. This is a bigger picture, um, strategic kind of thing, maybe setting up next week, but thinking about it on a, on a data and a digital and a, and a regional strength. Um, <clears throat> the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. Um, which is the, the lobbying group for technology, automotive technologies in the US, released a roadmap last week for automated vehicles and how to get AVs into US roads faster. Um, there isn't necessarily one of those for smart manufacturing, but there's also, when you look at it a little differently, um, Earlier this week, Bosch and Deutsche Telekom and SAP Siemens ZF created its own data platform in, in Germany. And it was structured or intended to basically prevent um, reliance on other national systems, the Chinese or even maybe American or, or others. Uh, both of your companies are very global and rely on different sectors, different markets, different different regions. How does, we've talked of, of this group of companies that we brought together as an ecosystem. There are lots of ecosystems. How does the nationalistic ecosystem play into this broader technology ecosystem? Um, where you have um, the economy minister, Peter, Altmaier from Germany saying, we want to ensure value-added manufacturing and employment in Europe are secure. Not the only country to do this, but you've got, you take companies that work on a very, very fluid, very, very transportable topic, data, and work with companies. How do, you, how do we start to protect our own regions, which every region wants to do, but realize this is a national, you know, global, international, challenge of developing smarter technologies. But I'd throw that easy one at you before we end it today. So do you want me to start on this one? Or? Oh, yeah, please, ahead, please, please start. Yeah, please. sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so you're talking, at least what I'm hearing a, a bit too, and we just went through a very bizarre political cycle in the U.S., right? So this is a very, you know, geopolitical, charged question right whereas um you know so you know bring jobs back to the to the u.s right so you know part of the struggle at least with with automotive jobs even within the u.s they don't have the same emission standards right so they've been fighting for you know california standards versus uh the rest of the country and things like that so Whereas uh, I, I take a look outside of the u.s and, and you know there's politics involved too but but the, the fact is is they, they seem to be a bit more um, holistic in the approach and maybe they have better consensus in their their governing boards and, and things like that as well. Um, but you know also I, in my opinion, right? It's it is the the, the globe is shrinking for sure, right? Yeah. So we, we need um, you know I think it's in our best interest to continue to move towards more open architectures, you know have products and technologies and services that that people can enable grow into their business and use to become more productive right and from proprietary languages and things like this we we've had iterations in manufacturing around that right and and you know so the 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 move over the past you know several years is really kind of you know more to a, an open architecture type environment so, so Tom, thanks for, I, I realize that's a politically dangerous place to go and I appreciate you speaking to that. And Florian, there is nothing more fluid, I think, than data. That data can be uh, created anywhere and moved anywhere. 
How do you, right. as Dell, certainly a global company like Dell, how do you work with them um, moving that data both from vehicles and, and other things and manufacturing? How do you step through all of those nationalistic regional challenges? So it, it's, it's, it's very difficult. So let me quickly pick up the statement from Thomas around op open architectures. And this is exactly what we need, not only in Germany, but, but everywhere in the world. So um, we have to focus more on open source technologies. And we have to create an, an open ecosystem to allow different participants to offer um, tools, frameworks, and libraries, for example. And um, the second um, thought that I want to give you also is um, the government has to think about um, standards and regulations around sharing data, around moving data, and also around homologating um, functionalities, especially in the self-driving car area. So a diesel gate, a diesel gate will never happen again. Um, OEMs will not be allowed to certify their vehicles on their own. This will not happen anymore. So I'm pretty sure that certification authorities such as NHTSA in US, TÜV and DECRA in Germany, and CARTAG in China, they will certify self-driving cars independently from, from the OEM itself. And to answer your second question, it's a big challenge to move data physically or virtually around the world. You cannot really move petabytes of data from US to Europe. It's not possible. It's so expensive to send these amounts of data over. And very often it's also um, difficult to get data out of Europe into any other country in the world because of the GDPR, the Data Privacy Act that we, are, we have to anonymize the data before we are allowed to send it out. And there's a third challenge, how to get data out of China into any other country in the world, because we have some Chinese regulations in place mm -hmm. that do not allow us to move data out of China before it gets checked and certified from an independent authority. Just my, my, three, my three thoughts on this. Back to you, Brett. Yeah, it's so a good good point actually that the data isn't that fluid because it does cost a lot to yeah. that's a great point. It, it seems so simple that you just press a button and it goes from here to there, but it costs mm -hmm. another a couple of closing things. One is um we spent time and Tom maybe you can read this one talking about kind of the big companies. I've heard more and more talk about industry 4.0 or as one of my good associates calls it industry 5.0. Um, being an enabler for small companies, for, for agile companies, for companies that are able to implement quickly and, and shift, pivot even quicker. How does this technology, this strategy help enable smaller companies? Yeah, and that you bring up a good point. So at least at Rockwell, we work with thousands and thousands of very small machine builders, custom machine builders, et cetera, right? And, and we're seeing you know, uh, some adoption of, of let's call it the remote monitoring tools, things like this. And, and the machine, uh, you know, builder community really is trying to push their end user or their customers to adopt. And, and you know, some of the, uh, the obstacles or roadblocks have, have been in the terms of, you know, they, they won't let them VPN into the machine or things like this. So I, I think that the, the, let's call it the small and medium sized companies are very thirsty, ready to go at any time, and have already started to include a lot of this within their um, uh, their purview and, and roadmap for machine. Um, let's call it, uh, you know, value. Uh, so that's on the machine uh, builder side. On on the end user side, I, you know, it's you look at the uh, the tier eco structure, and you know, a, a lot of these mega suppliers, right? So. Um, are, you know, certainly have, um, you know, let's call it dependency on downstream suppliers as well. And I think just naturally, you're going to be moving into the same sorts of requirements there in terms of traceability, in terms of, um, let's call it optics around uh, production, because, you know, what they're trying to do is, uh, you know, let's call it, uh, 
get an understanding of what the true cost structure is further upstream so they can kind of, you know, let's bring that in the open and use that as a negotiating tactic potentially, right? So, so for we want to wrap this up. We're, we're just about at our limit, but I want to carry this thought for a moment. Tom talked to the manufacturing, the, the small companies, the agile small companies. You and your data world, I'm sure, come into a whole lot of contact with small startup data data creators or data aggregators or data companies. That, those small companies that have a great idea, how do they play a role in, in, in specifically industry 4.0, but the broader um, data thread? Um, so in, in this area, very often these startups are starting in the public cloud and after their, their solutions are proven to be successful and they are scaling, they are realizing that it's, it's um, a more cheap and more cost efficient on-premise and then they are moving everything to an on-premise infrastructure. Very good. Hey, we have gone, I think, one minute over time. Florian, Dr. Florian Bauman, Tom, Matt, thank you both very much. This was really appreciative. For those of you that are still with us, we hope you enjoyed it. Um, the slides will be up available, actually, and we may have had a little time with that, Florian. We apologize, Florian. Um, I hope you'll join us next Friday at 10 o'clock for kind of the wrap up to all of this. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks for having us there, Brad. Bye. -bye. Take care. Have a good day.